My name is Heather Pivover. I am a advocate for open science. I'm really passionate about open science. I help to found a nonprofit called Our Research to help make open science happen faster than it otherwise would. So there's lots of kinds of open access. And what you even call open access depends on what you want to use it for. So in some ways, people just want to read things. And the term open access has been used for just reading stuff. Some people want to use things for machine learning. So in those cases, what you might consider open access has a lot to do with reuse rights. Other times people are concerned about preservation. And so then whether you can redistribute um, has a lot to do with what you consider open access. So um, what oh, the definitions of open access can be pretty complicated because of that. So first of all, one of the attributes that people often care about is where is the paper hosted? So is it on the publisher site or is it somewhere else in a different repository? In the attribute of on a publisher site, the most common kind that people talk about is gold open access. And what that means is on the publisher site and it has a, a license associated with it that's open, which is normally a Creative Commons uh, license. Furthermore, it's in a journal where all of the um, papers are um, open. And so that's a gold open access journal. A subtype of a gold open access journal, I think, is a platinum or a um, diamond open access journal. And those are ones that have no APC charge. It doesn't cost anything to publish there. So that's a subtype of gold open access. Now, there's a kind of article that looks, the article itself, looks and is licensed exactly like a gold open access journal, but because the whole journal around it, um, sorry, I should have said, the, the article itself looks just like a gold open access article, but the journal around it is not all gold open access. It, the rest of the journal is a subscription journal. So the, the article is exactly the same as a gold open access article because it's in an otherwise subscription journal. That article is often called a hybrid open access journal. So those are some of the two main classifications, gold and hybrid. Now there's a third one, and actually me and my co-authors coined this term, so if you don't like it, we're the ones to blame. We added yet another color or metal to the whole problem. We called it bronze open access because we did a study and we found that there's a lot of things that are free to read on a publisher site, but they don't actually have an open license on them. So they don't have a, C, a Creative Commons license and they don't even have a publisher specific license often. Um, they're just free to read sort of by the publisher's goodwill. Sometimes they're free to read right after they're published because they're promotional. Sometimes they're free to read um, and sometimes those might only be free to read for a few weeks or a few months and then taken down and sometimes the don't, publishers don't tell you about that. Sometimes they're free to read because there's a special issue and the publishers have just made an agreement with those conference writers, for example, to make that a special issue uh, free to read but not openly licensed. And sometimes they're free to read because the back content is made open but again it's not openly licensed and so theoretically the publishers could take that uh, down again. So that is often named bronze open access. Some people don't think that is open access at all. Um, if you actually care about reuse rights, it doesn't have guaranteed reuse rights. So that, that is free to read and sometimes it's called open access, sometimes not dependent on, on what you most care about. So then there's this whole other type of open access uh, and it's green open access. And again, those articles can look exactly the same. Uh, furthermore, you can even take a gold or a hybrid or a uh, sometimes a bronze open access article and put it in a repository. So you, the repository might be a database in your university. It might be a, called an institutional repository. It might be a disciplinary repository like um, archive or bioarchive, for example, or it might be um, 
uh, or PubMed Central actually is a really common one. Okay, those are the only ones I can think of right now. <laughs> um, or ResearchGate, but it's not really a repository, so most people don't call it that. Anyway, if you take a public, uh, an article and put it in one of these repositories, the fact that it's not hosted on a publisher site means that it's green away. Now, often those things have an open license associated with them, but not always. Often they are the final version of record, the one that looks all pretty with the proper pictures and page numbers and so on, but not always. And sometimes, in fact, they're even submitted before peer review um, and a different version of the article. So anyway, that's green OA. And as you can see, people uh, articles can be green OA and also one of those other kinds. Uh, and I think those are the main those are the main colors that I know of. <laughs> Open access is a really political term, and I think that what you want to use it for, uh, you need to recognize that that's the case. And so when you include black open access in it, pirated open access, I think in lots of ways you're diluting it such that it's not very useful anymore. What you're really talking about then is what can you find somehow somewhere on the internet, even if you're willing to go through illegal means. Now, I'm a pretty big fan of being able to find things however you can. I think that's got lots going for it, including showing how hard it is to get things legally, including showing how popular it is when you can just get whatever, how much people actually want to read. Um, and just just getting stuff done fast. <laughs> I, think there's I'm, I think there's lots of power in the fact that you can get things illegally. I think that we shouldn't ignore that or the patterns and things we can learn from it. I don't think we should call it open access though. In my experiences, in the conversations I'm in, librarians and publishers alike mostly ignore SciHub. They act like it doesn't exist. They don't talk about it. So I think they're, I, not everybody, and sometimes they do, and I tend to bring it up in conversations, because I think it's really worth noting um, that that is a path that a lot of people are getting their literature right now, and it certainly affects your subscription decisions and so on. I think it needs to be talked about more um, as part of actual decisions. On the, and that there's certainly things we can learn from it. On the other hand, I think it's also worth not overstating how it should be included. I don't think that librarians, for example, should be making very many subscription decisions, assuming that things will continue to be available on Sci-Hub. They might not. It could be taken down. It shouldn't be counted on. Um, but it is there right now, and it's something we should be talking about. An important part of open access is what version of the article is made open access. So you could think about four different versions. One of them is a preprint, as it's often called, or something that perhaps isn't even submitted to a journal article. It's just an early version. The second version is a submitted version. That's what is usually submitted to a uh, journal, but it's not it's before formal peer review. So it might have had informal peer review, people within your lab group or other people on the internet, but it hasn't gone through some of that official peer review process. The name of the um, version after it's gone through that official peer review process, if it has then been accepted to a journal, is usually the accepted version. And finally, there's a final version that's actually published in the journal, and that's called a published version. Now, you can make it more complicated than this too. Afterwards, there might be revisions or corrections and so on, but that's, the, that's a general framework. Yeah, it's a really exciting time for open access because we're actually just hitting a tipping point from a number of different ways of looking at it. So one way of looking at it is articles that are published right now, about half of them become open access. And that's just been true as of last few years. Right now, if, a pub if an article gets published, about half of those articles will at some point soon become open access. Um, if you look at what is available to read right now, and what, sorry, if you look at what people actually read, what they really read, they're 
what they really want to read, about half of that is also available open access. So even though people like to read old articles and old articles are less likely to be open access, people are more likely to make the papers that are popular and read open access. So that means even taking all that old content into account that's more likely to be closed, the stuff that people want to read is often open. And that means that right now, what people want to read right now is, is about half open as well. Depends on the discipline. I think we'll get into that more later. But um, yeah, it's pretty exciting. Looking ahead, that, that numbers continue to grow, the amount of open access. When we look out five years, we think in about five years, about 70% of what people will want to read is open access. And that's pretty exciting. And that really changes the conversation. Yeah, the amount of open access is growing fast. So the reasons it's been growing so far have been the authors be becoming more familiar with it. And they're realizing that they want people to read what they're writing. And so they're voluntarily making their stuff open access. But even more of a driver than that is that various universities and funders have made it a requirement <laughs> for people to publish open access. And that's really what's powered a lot of the rapid increase over the last five and 10 years and will power it uh, going forward. So really in some ways it's a little hard to predict exactly because it depends on when these when large funders uh, go ahead and make um, requirements that affect a lot of people. If we use how often the requirements have come in in the past and think they'll keep coming in at about the same rate and affecting about the same percentage of people over time, I think, I think we will get to close to 100% open access in the next, I don't know, 10 to 20 years. But I don't think it'll be linear like that. I don't think that extrapolation is actually what can, what's gonna happen. It won't be the, sort of the slow and steady climb. It'll do that, I think, for another few years. And then at some point, it'll just seem like the right and easy thing to do for funders to make those requirements. And they'll all start to do it all of a sudden. And it'll be more rapid. And I think that will happen in about 10 years. That's my guess. So I think there'll be a discontinuity where a lot will become open access all of a sudden. Will it ever be 100%? I'm not sure, probably not. My, most things in life aren't 100%, so probably not. And it's also worth thinking, what we're talking about is the research literature, not necessarily the front matter, like editorials, and, and not necessarily um, perspective pieces that are becoming open access. I think there's a good chance those may be subscription only for a while, sort of the same way that magazines and newspapers are. Um, it's the primary research literature that I think has the, the largest uh, change and, and is most likely to get to close to 100%. Yeah, we should definitely try to reach 100% open access. And that's because more is definitely better. So for all the reasons we want any open access, I think we want all open access. We want all the research that we do to be available to everybody at any time to use for anything. It's the it's humanity's knowledge. We want, we want that to flow like water for people to be able to build on it from unexpected places, unexpected things, use all of our tax dollars, all of our foundation dollars, all of the money we're putting into research, unlock all of the potential of that research without having it put behind gates. Uh, and we don't know how high those gates are for people. That's how I see uh, paywalls and, and they're just in the way. So yeah, I think we want to get to 100% open access. So I think it would be great if tenure and promotion committees or even just your annual review that your department does when you're a grad student of your work or your assistant professor work or whatever, um, I think it would be great if they gave you bonus points for making things open, whether it's your papers open, your data open, or your software open. I think that would be good and I think it would be in line with a university's philosophical goals of advancing knowledge and understanding. The truth is, I'm not sure they have to do that. And the reason is that open is its own reward because when you make your papers open or when you make your data open or your software open, more people read them, more people use them. Your download counts go up 
And then your citations go up. People use your work. And tenure and promotion committees do already care about citations. They are starting to care about alternative metrics like the number of GitHub stars that you have for your software. So I think that even without considering open as its own criteria, the outcomes of open, which is more use, are considered already. And I think that they go up when you make things open, the rewards are already there. Yeah, well, one of the great things about unexpected places is I don't know what they are, but I can try to think of some places where uh, people might use the research literature that aren't being currently supported by our subscription structure, where we imagine that people within the ivory tower have access to the things they need for their discipline. So one is that the um, a university that doesn't have a med school, doesn't have a school of medicine, doesn't usually subscribe to medical school journals. Well, that university might have a great computer science department that's doing a lot of natural language processing. And wouldn't it be great if they could get access to the um, papers, the medical papers, and mine them and find discoveries that way? And right now, they can't because those universities with those great computer science schools might not have the med schools. So that's one example just sort of within our ivory tower framework. Another that's really easy to see, and in some ways it's not an expected use, uh, people have been talking about this, is patients looking at health uh, medicine. They often don't have access. And there's some frameworks where maybe they can get um, access, but not, not at the time they really need it, in the middle of the night at the hospital bed with nobody in the way. That's a time you don't want um, uh, gates between you and the, and the literature to understand what you need to know. A few other places, science fairs. So were any of you guys nerdy enough to do science fairs? Because I sure was. And yeah, the research literature, it's hard to read for sure. But don't underestimate a motivated 16 year old, right? Who really loves dinosaurs or whatever it is, they're really gonna, they're gonna dig in and they're gonna get it. And we don't want uh, us and our paywalls in the way. Yeah, fields have different rates of open access. I think mostly that's true for historical reasons, but the historical reasons vary. So um, the arts and humanities have typically had really low rates of open access. And I think that one of the reasons that that's true is a lot of the open access models that have been most popular and common to date have required a fee for publishing open access. Those fees are often paid by grants, but people in the arts and humanities have had relatively small grants that haven't paid for open access fees. And that's one of the reasons why they've had low um, uptakes of, of open access. Um, Chemistry and engineering have also had low rates of open access, but I think that's for different reasons. Um, their journals are really expensive and they have a lot of industry use and there hasn't been an easy, compelling um, story to say why chemistry and engineering have been open access. So there hasn't been much rallying for it and the journals have been reticent because they make so much money on it. So compare that to medicine and biology, where the rates of open access are some of the highest. So there you can make a really compelling, and people do indeed make a really compelling um, philosophical case about why those papers should be OA. They've also got large grants for the most part, and they're funded more or less centrally. So one decision by the US uh, Institute of Health, which is the largest funder uh, of of biomed in the US and therefore I think in the world, um, the decision of them to start PubMed Central and make it a requirement that all the things they fund are available away in there after a year really changed the landscape of uh, the percentage of biomed that was away. And that in turn makes 
the publishers need to do business models that support that and find ways to make that lucrative. And those journals and open access also gets a good reputation because everybody's doing it. It's required. It's not seen as some lower quality article. It's just seen as a way you can get the paper. And so I think that a lot of these things that start for historical reasons, you can get into a positive feedback loop that makes the rates continue to go up or stays or stay low or whatever. So in some fields, like in chemistry and in engineering, they've got strong ties to industry. And um, industry wants to keep its secrets and make lots of money based on its discoveries. And so it doesn't want to make the raw data and the raw source code behind its papers open. That makes it more easy for other people to replicate and build on their results. I don't think that's OK. I think that when industry is publishing um, in academic journals, they're doing that to build a reputation. And I think that is okay. In fact, I think that's great. I think they're building a reputation based on sharing their knowledge so that other people can learn from it and being seen as experts. But I think that comes with the requirement that they also make that knowledge available for others. That should be part of what it means to do science, to be in the academy and to publish, is that you um, make the information available that lets others verify and validate your results. So I think they people in the industry absolutely should publish in academic journals, but I think they should be held to the same level as um, people within universities who do that, and that is to make their raw materials available. Okay, so as a nonprofit, why are we making Unsub? It seems like a little bit of a weird tool for a nonprofit to build. The reason is that we believe in a world with universal open access, 100% open access. Big publishers are in the way of that right now. Elsevier, Wiley, Springer, Nature, to more, to more or less degrees across them uh, and others as well. And that's because their current way of doing it, the status quo is so lucrative, is making them lots of money. <laughs> they don't have an incentive to flip their journals to open access. They'll do it if the funders require it and the funders are requiring it slowly and hopefully more quickly. But we want to put more pressure on them. We want to make it easier for them to flip. And the way to make it easier for the publishers to flip is for them to be making less money right now. One of the big targets for that is the, is, the, is the big deal. So what a big deal is, is it's a bundle of journals. It's most of the journals that the publisher publishes, and you can buy them all together. And when you buy them all together, you get access to all of them in return for one price. The thing is that price keeps going up and up and up. And maybe it was a good deal 10 years ago, but the big deal is no longer a good deal. And you're really stuck as a library. If you subscribe to it 10 years ago, you kind of just have to keep paying whatever they quote you year after year. And you're scared to leave, right? You're scared that your students and faculty will say, well, why did you cut this? I liked that. I, this is inconvenient for me. And you as a librarian feel a desire and a real need to make that content available. But even to journals that frankly, aren't used very much. You don't have the data to know they're not very used, for, used very much. Unsub's helping you figure out what is and isn't used so that you can cancel with confidence. You could cancel your big deal with confidence. Just subscribe to a few journals, the ones that your university actually needs, that takes a bunch of money out of the pocket of the publishers that you can then reinvest in your university. And it also gives an incentive for the publishers to look at alternative business models like open access. Yeah, so I'm part of the team that um, developed Unpaywell, I think about three years ago. So we, let me tell you what it is and why we did it and then how it's being used. So we created Unpaywell because we needed it. 
which is always the best reason to make anything. So I am part of a small nonprofit called Our Research. And one of the um, tools we built in our early days was some profiles for researchers that helped them show off all of their open science achievements and gave them fun little badges about it. So it would call you an open access hero if you had a lot of your publications be open access or an open access tri uh, open science triathlete if you had open papers and open open data and open source. And one thing we realized was as we were trying to build that, it was really hard to know which paper was open access. I was really surprised. I thought that that information would surely be somewhere, uh, but it wasn't, not all in one place. So we realized that we wanted it for that profile tool and surely the world wanted it for other things that we didn't know quite what at that point. So we started pulling together um, the data from a lot of different sources. We pulled together papers from Crossref. Um, uh, uh, gold open access journals from DOAJ, the Directory of Open Access Journals. Pulled in green open access from um, thousands of repositories around the world. So thousands of universities and discipline uh, repositories like PMC and Archive. They've got an, uh, an open standard, luckily, that reveals all their openness and, and so on. So a lot of different sources. And then we further validated it to make sure it was accurate. Because some of these sources, they sort of do a high recall strategy. So here's all the things that might be open. But we then double checked that they were and that ended up with a, a very high a very large and very accurate repository that we indexed by doi so that data object identifier that unique id that's associated with each paper by having that be the key the way in most people know the doi for their paper and then all of a sudden you get all the open access all the places it is what kind of open access what's the link and so on um, we were able to use that in our pr little profile program uh, which we stopped working on so much as soon as open as unpaywell got more popular because people started using it for example to put open access links in web of science and scopus and europe pmc all of those links are driven by the unpaywell database there's a free browser extension that you can install um, for Chrome and Firefox that will help you uh, find an open access paper. It pops up a cute little green icon. If we can find a, a free and legal copy of the paper you're looking at somewhere on online. And then this, this is a really cool um, use. Um, in libraries, they have a thing called a link resolver. So in your university library, if you use its discovery services to find things, and then you click on the link to the article your university goes and looks up whether it subscribes to that paper and if it does it sends you to that paper and if it doesn't it sends you to it their interlibrary loan page but now libraries all, thousands of libraries have turned on the unpaywall check um, for free that before if if the library doesn't subscribe it checks our database to see if we know of a free and legal copy of it somewhere on the internet and if so it sends the user straight there so you don't need to go uh, to the interlibrary loan page and so that both um, saves librarians a lot of time and effort it gets the paper to the person more quickly and also frees up librarians to potentially unsubscribe from things uh, that are largely open access at this point So because we're the makers of this unpaywall database, this, this great big link of open access that lots of people use for lots of things, librarians started coming to us and said, hey, unpaywall, you guys have lots of open access information. Do you have that information available by journal? Because publishers have told us they won't double dip. Publishers have told us they won't charge us in subscription, whatever is already available open access. But we don't quite trust them. We'd like to bring our own data. We're not sure that we are not being um, taken advantage of here. The amount of open access keeps going up, but our subscription prices also keep going up. They aren't going down like you'd expect. So we want to know this open access information uh, by journal. And we, we thought about that. We thought, yeah, that's a great point. It's complicated, though. 
Because in order to use that information to make subscription decisions, you don't just want to know what number of papers in a given journal or open access. You want to know at the time people in your university want to read a paper in that journal, is it open access right then? Yeah. So people normally want to read a paper right when it comes out. Well, that's actually often not when it's available OA. Lots of journals, lots of journals say you're not allowed to put your paper into your repository for a year. And they do that on purpose, right? Because people like reading a paper in the first year, so they wait. So we, so in order to do those calculations that would be useful for librarians, we had to take into account what's available open access when, not just in terms of papers, but in terms of use. So we realized that's more complicated than just an Excel spreadsheet we could uh, dump out of our system. Furthermore, open access is an important part of that um, piece, but so is a back file or perpetual access. So lots of librarians have actually been, as part of a subscription they've been paying for years, they've been buying the content that they've had and they would keep owning that even if they were to cancel the journal. So the fact they've got access to all that back content is also relevant. And so we thought that combining a tool that looks at that back content um, by discipline and this open access would be helpful um, for librarians to consider their um, subscription decisions. So we put all that together into to a tool called Unsub. It's been out for about a year. Um, it's in use or soon to be in use by about 500 libraries all across the world. One of our earliest uses was the State University of New York. They were actually in active uh, conversations with Elsevier about their big deal for which they were paying nine million dollars a year for 60 universities. This is all public knowledge. <laughs> So they were paying us for $9 million a year um, for access for 60 universities, some big, some really small. And uh, they said elsewhere, $9 million is too much. Um, here's all our data about why it's too much. Give us a cheaper price. And Elsevier wouldn't. So SUNY said, okay, then we're going to cancel our big deal. And we're going to just subscribe to 248 journals instead. Not all 2,000 in our big deal, just these 248. And we've picked these 248 based on what people read on our campuses, how much the subscription cost is, and using UNSEB, how much of it's open access. So they used UNSEB to help them motivate um, this, this decision and to pick those, um, those articles and uh, those journals, excuse me. And now they're just paying uh, $2 million a year, I think. So they're saving $7 million a year. And it is less convenient for their faculty sometimes, but not very often. And again, they're saving $7 million a year. They're, they're committed to getting those articles that they aren't subscribed to in other ways, through interlibrary loan, through document delivery, and so on. And their researchers, I think, have been really pretty happy. They're not the only ones to do this either. The University of California, MIT, lots of others have walked away from their subscription. So UNSUB is one of the tools where we're helping to bring data to uh, libraries for their custom situation to help them decide what's the best, uh, the best um, decision for them about their subscriptions uh, in these days with more and more budget tightening and also more and more open access. Yeah, you should definitely publish your research open access. And let me tell you why. I'm going to go with three reasons. The first is that it makes your research more impactful. And that's why you did it. You did it so it would make a difference. And so you don't want things to be in the way of someone in a university who doesn't subscribe to your journal being able to use it. You don't want it to be in the way of a policymaker reading, a politician, somebody reading the article, uh, a journalist being able to read the article. So if it's open access, all those people can read it. And the hard research you're doing um, will help them and what they're doing and, and make more of a difference. Reason number two is it'll help you. Their reading of it um, counts as reading statistics. If they're in some scenario that cites, there you'll get more citations. So it will actually help your career by boosting your stats, including the quantitative ones that you can put on your reviews and so on. And the third reason is for a bunch of you, after you're done, you may not be in a university that's rich enough to subscribe to your own journal. 
You might not be in a university at all. And you'll still care about your topic. You might be in industry, you might be somewhere else. You'll still care, you'll still want to read, for example, uh, things that people write. And how frustrating would it be if you can't read your own paper or you can't read the paper of other people like you? So I really suggest that you be the change you want to see. And at that point, you're really going to want to see an open access world. Yeah, so be part of it right now. So I'm a real open science advocate, and I advocate for being an open science advocate and um, eating your own dog food, as people say, and, and being an open science advocate yourself. I think that's one of the, and doing your own research open access. It is hard sometimes, hard, hard. It's embarrassing, it's scary, it's time consuming, but you know you're doing what's right, and you know that, by doing it, you're helping other people um, who come after you. Look at you, look at what you've done and take it as a model and build on your shoulders, um, just like you're building on others. So I think practically what I would recommend is in your field, as you read, take a note of who is doing things in an open way and try to learn from them and build on what they've done. So you could write, write to them and talk to them or just see what, what have they, where have they published where, what have they done with their code? How are they sharing their data? And then try to do that as well. I have often um, looked for in, um, innovative places to publish. So if you're at a spot where you can do that, be one of the first ones uh, submitting your journal somewhere. Um, try out some new things. As a student, as a grad student, it's a really great time to do that. So don't sacrifice your whole career and normal metrics to do it, but it's a great time to also experiment. And I would say as you do that, just be kind to yourself. It is hard. Uh, that's normal. Um, just keep trying hard. That's the way uh, science and research gets better.